Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, Conversations, News from a World in Flux. I'm Claire Farrell. I'm Dr Charlie Gardner. And today um, we're going to be talking about more science. Yay, so science! <laughs> so um, we've done an awful lot of talking about politics, about think tanks, about uh, how the narrative is being shaped. But uh, there are two papers here that are on the table for, for discussion. Um, I, for me, you know, the reason why this has come up and um, we've compiled it in this way is because some time ago somebody sent me this um, article which said uh, Dr Andrew Forrest, richest man in Australia, I think, also known as Twiggy. <laughs> um, it's very different to the old original Twiggy <laughs> that we used to have in this country. But he um, gave a, t a, a talk at a conference about wet bulb and the main takeaway message was if my business and the business of other people in our field is going to kill your children, you have to fucking stop us. And I'm serious and here I'm going to explain to you how wet bulb affects the human body. And perhaps another time we'll go into what wet bulb means. Yeah, we should. And we'll link his talk in the in the description of this on the YouTube video so that people can click through and listen to it. It's an extraordinary piece of communications, in my opinion, particularly from somebody in the private sector. Um, and particularly in light of the British government's behaviours around, you know, not supporting narratives and policies that help businesses to move in the right direction. But it relates really closely, I think, to these new... Um, frameworks, if you like, that people are working on how to analyse the actual human cost, the actual real price that you pay for carbon emissions and for unmitigated, um, you know, deadly climate climate breakdown. So do you want to tell us about the papers and, and what's in them? Yeah. So there's, as you say, this is you know, a bunch of new research that is looking to, to quantify the impacts of our emissions in what it means in terms of human lives. And this is really important because so far we've always talked about it in these abstract terms. You know, we talk about tons of emissions, we talk about temperatures, you know, is it gonna be 2.3 or 2.7 or 3.2? What the fuck does that mean? Like, I, I can't imagine a difference between 2.7 degrees and a 2.3 degrees heating. It just doesn't mean anything to me. If we're not talking about climate, um, the impacts of climate inaction in human terms, we're talking about it in economic terms always, like, you know, um, you, you know, decarbonizing will cost this much or it will save this much, or you know, this fossil fuel project will boost the economy by this much or it'll cause all these jobs. Um, so we're constantly just having this conversation on purely economic terms or purely scientific terms but ultimately, the impacts are on people. Like ultimately, yeah. the impact is on stuff getting destroyed and people dying. And it's fantastic to see that researchers are now trying to quantify it in this way. So there was one paper by um, Tim Lenton at Exeter and the team of researchers that was published a couple of months ago now in a Nature Journal. And they looked at um, this concept of the human climate niche. Basically, humans can't just live anywhere on the planet there are places where it is too hot and there are places where if you have a mean annual temperature above 29 degrees just humans can't live there it, it, it's too hot currently those places um are just a tiny it's it's like less than a percent of, of the earth it's just a few places in the sahara um, but when you look at future climate projections obviously the, the uninhabitable part of the earth it's just going to grow and grow and grow as we, um, yeah, as the planet heats up. So what Lenton's research did is it showed that if we allow um, planetary heating to reach 2.7 degrees, which is where existing pledges will take us, um, so you know it's where we're headed. At least. At least, yeah, minimum. <laughs> at least, yeah. We'll talk about all the. Um, all the conservative elements of these projections another time maybe um, but yeah we're talking about a minimum of 2.7 2 degrees what will that mean for actual people well it will mean basically one third of all people on earth 
won't be living inside the human niche anymore. The places where they currently live will not be inhabitable in future. Can you just tell us why do people use the term human niche? Well, niche is an eco it's a term that comes from ecology. It basically, um, you know, every species, every organism on Earth has a particular set of conditions to which it is adapted. Polar bears can't survive in the Sahara because they're adapted to a completely different thing. They mm. live in cold places. And this, you know, obviously um, one of the things that, that technology has allowed us to do is, as modern humans have um, have, have evolved and, and you know, developed all this amazing technology with clothing and stuff like that. Mm. It's allowed us to spread um, into, you know, expand our niche a little bit and we're living in places where we wouldn't be able to be if we didn't have clothes and advanced agriculture and all this. But despite all our um, technology and everything we've developed, there are still some fundamental limits to what the human body can support and there's all sorts of different mechanisms for that there are different um, reasons why we can't live in places um, which have a mean annual temperature above 29 degrees but the fact is nobody lives in places that hot now we can't live there and yet you know basically if we reach 2.7 degrees basically most of the tropics will be uninhabitable to human beings so mm -hmm. that's one of the pieces of research looking at the human impact of this another one by um, a guy called uh, Richard Parker who's has done lots of research on what emissions mean in terms of deaths like how many people um, are expected to die in future as yeah, as a result of our emissions now. A friend, um, a friend of mine said to me the other day, she's uh, involved with all the health campaigning. She used this phrase, which has just like, not left me, which is the reason why it's important for medics to talk, to speak out about climate is because you can't argue with a body bag. It's a, ho it's a horrible brutal, thing to say, isn't it? Isn't it? It's brutal. so brutal. But I found this really interesting when you said about, you know, being able to, being able to offer a framework of saying, yeah, if you do this, this is the projected death count, and we need we need that. Don't we, we do, we do, um, because this is the ultimate impact, and this is ultimately, you know, the most important thing. We, you know, humans seem to place we place a huge value in deaths. Like you know, when you get extraordinary extreme weather events, where. You know, tens of thousands of people might lose their homes in flooding or whatever, but mm. the headline will say six people died. Um, and of yeah. course, you know, it's a very, very low death rate because we have all these warning systems. You know, people were warned and they were evacuated mm. um, before the flooding came. So we tend to have very low death rates. But I find it it's a bit weird how the headline always leaves, leads with the deaths, like you know, 10 you know, millions of acres destroyed, tens of thousands of people homeless, six deaths, and that's the headline. And mm. yet, so, so you know, death is an important indicator. It's an important thing to try and prevent. Yeah. And yet, when we're talking about climate change, we don't talk about it. It's, we, we, we focus on preventing deaths in every way, except when it comes to climate change, mm. and then suddenly it doesn't matter. And that's why it's important that we start talking about emissions in terms of death. So what Panka and his uh, co-researchers have done is um, using a range of, of different methods, they basically have come up with, with this rule of thumb figure, which mm -hmm. is basically for every 1,000 tonnes of emissions, one person dies. Um, but then when... So, so, so we have this figure, you know, it's the... the it, it's... It's an uncertain figure. It's just you know, correct to the nearest it order sound of very magnitude. High, does it? I mean, a thousand tons of a gas is. I always think it's quite. It must be quite a lot. I so I, personally, I, I think this um, this research does underestimate. It's a very very conservative estimate for how many people might die as a result of this. And I think it, it it could well be an underestimate. But what's interesting when you have this this rough figure of you know, a thousand tons per death, is that if you then start applying that figure to fossil fuel projects, for example, you then start to see the, um, 
the real, real impacts of it. You know, we talk about, and it's crazy, isn't it? We talk about, oh, we must, you know, government are like, right, we must do this project because it'll create jobs. Mm. Well, what about the fucking deaths? Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a fellow on Twitter, a retired scientist, who's done this um, very preliminary analysis, hasn't been peer reviewed yet or hasn't been, been published yet. Um, but looking at the, I think the, the new coal mine that's been given go ahead in, in Cumbria. Um, when you look at the figures for how much emissions will be produced over the lifetimes of, of, of that project, the number of people that will die as a result of, that, of the emissions from that project outnumber the jobs created by 100 to 1. For every job created, 100 people in other countries, probably, yeah. will die. Um, and it, you know, when, when you hear that, yes, yes, it's, um, yeah, it's a back of an envelope calculation, but it's mm. important to think in those terms. It's important when we hear this will create X number of jobs, it's important that the answer is, okay, but how many people will die as a result of that? Mm. And it's really, really um, fundamental that this area of research is, is, um, gets more attention that we start, you know, get, becomes more methodologically sophisticated so we can get more precise with these elements. And that uh, we, we talk about it, we, we, we use this. Um, so for me, the, you know, the, the really fundamental important thing about this research is not the numbers it generates, it's the shift in the way we think about things that it could catalyze. Um, yeah. So it's, it's yeah, it, it, as worrying as the figures that are being generated are, it's great to see that this is a conversation that's being started. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we rely quite a lot on things like this. I remember a while ago, there was um, a new paper that was written about the economic damage to individual nation states because of the climate crisis. And I think drawing some equivalence between the investment that was coming from certain countries in terms of how much they're accelerating the crisis, how much they're seeking to profit from it, what, how many, how many um, dollars are going in or whatever, compared with how much economic damage is being done to other nation states because of the extreme impact. So you could quantify, for example, the amount of fossil fuel activity that's funded through Britain or that's funded through the United States of America. And then you could look at the damage that's been done to the Maldives or the economy of Pakistan because of the enormous flooding or and so on. And so you'd start to be able to have a framework to say, OK, well, this was caused by these investments and it has cost these people this much. Therefore, you have a new way to look at the conversation around loss and damage, right? Because at the moment, it feels like that's, I mean, they've, we've, we feel we've made almost no progress on loss and damage, right? It's, mm. it's, we, need, we need frameworks to help people to consciously sort of think about the way that you would work out something like that. At the moment, it feels like there's an awful lot of people going, oh, yeah, we don't really want to do that. Mm. So you know, we don't think we have to, but if you can say, this is the bill. <laughs> yeah. Is this the bill? That, that's it. That's it, isn't it? It's about being aware of the bill. So economists call these, the, you know, the bill, the costs, we call them externalities because they're, they're not factored into the economic, um, mm. the, the, the economic question. So the way our, our society sort of operates and the way our economy sort of operate is that um, we allow private interests, individuals, corporations, or whatever, to do things that will allow them to benefit. And yet, so, so the benefits of doing something are privatized. You, you as an individual or you as a corporation get all the benefits from whatever, from having this factory or from chopping down this bit of forest. Mm. But the costs are shared by everyone in the world. And they're, you know, most of those costs are, are, are paid by people in the most vulnerable countries that are um, that are yeah, suffering climate impacts. But it's, you know, it's a crazy situation because it allows things that are really valuable to everyone to be destroyed for a tiny, tiny amount of private gain. Take, for example, you know, a, a company, uh, an agribusiness company that wants to deforest some of the Amazon. Okay, so you know, they'll get X thousand dollars per year from growing the growing corn for beef on on that land and you know so 
they get X thousand per year, great. But what's being lost? So you know, in destroying that forest, they, you know, they cause flooding for people downstream. So people downstream are paying the costs. They um, have an impact on you know, a big carbon source that is no longer regulating the climate. So everyone in the world who's part of our shared climate is paying the cost, sharing the costs of that deforestation. There's a loss of biodiversity and there's a loss of you know, potential pharmaceutical drugs in that forest that we're never going to find about because it was destroyed. Or all that huge value destroyed just so one company can earn their X thousand dollars. And we, we really need to address this system where, where, where the costs of our actions aren't included in the equation that makes us think about whether that action should be allowed or not. If mm. something, if something you know, generates a hundred dollars of profit for someone, but at the cost of $10,000 worth of damage, paid for by everyone else, then obviously that equation is wrong. We shouldn't allow $10,000 worth of damage for $100 worth of profit. But at the moment we do, and it's partly because we don't quantify the damages and we, so we don't um, bring them into the equation. Yeah, and well, and what's worse, I think, is how we subsidize <laughs> the things that do the damage. I mean, you think about on a global scale, how much, how many, billions or trillions of, of dollars go into subsidizing this sector in order to keep it going. It's sort of, you know, it feels to me that the campaign that's happened in the Netherlands recently and the things that have, have been part of our mission in, in XR in the UK and elsewhere to say, look, can we just stop meddling with the, with the system so that it's like weighted in favor of the most polluting options, of the worst possible options that we have to yeah. stop? Can we not just can we not just stop, you know, weighting the dice for, yeah. for, for a minute? Because it seems extraordinary to me that on the one hand, economics as a discipline has helped us to to ign to blatantly ignore things that exist in the real world and pretend that they're not there. La 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 <laughs> not there, not there. And then also at the same time to be just shoveling cash in the direction of like putting fuel on the fire and then has the audacity to come out and say it's but it's free market <laughs> yeah that's it's it's just you know it you only have to look at it for a few seconds to to see that it's you know, entirely bullshit and I'm, I'm sure none of these um you know free market fundamentalists believe a word of their own their own pronouncements and that, you know, the things they say because um yeah there's no evidence that they actually want a free market at all. They you know, want state support for their industries, um, but they don't want state limits on their industries. So yeah. it's like a one-way free market. Don't, don't, um, don't put in place any legislation that would limit our bad behaviour, but do continue financially supporting us so that we can carry on with yeah. our bad behaviour. It's, it's, it's fundamentally very deeply dishonest, isn't and, it? And we saw that as well, I think, from the sort of 2008 crash, this sort of like confirmation, wasn't it, that like the state will always pick up the pieces. So therefore, you can actually be extraordinarily reckless. Yeah, do what you and like. And if they say you're too big to fail or if they say, oh, it will damage everyone else too much if we let you go down. So we'll just, we'll just make some money out of thin air and chuck it in your direction so that everything doesn't totally bottom out. It feels very, um, it feels like it's not going to be long before we've got kind of a, a whole generation of people who have grown up at that particular time. They didn't live through the Reagan, the Thatcher, the sort of neoliberal sort of, you know, push through into the 90s. There's going to be an awful lot of people, I think, coming through intergenerationally who saw that crash, who saw Occupy, who've seen this critique of the system, who've lived through the pandemic and the furlough schemes. They've seen how money can always be found, can always be created. It can always be put in the, in the, in the hands of people if you choose to do it as, yeah. as the state. But when it comes to doing the right thing by the climate or many, many other social issues, it's like, oh, but where are you going to get the money from? It's like, well, the other day you made loads <laughs> just like come out of air. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's hope, you know, this, 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 this growing realisation, this growing lack of faith in, in the system 
um, you know, manifest itself as people becoming more more politically engaged. It is, you know, it is a concern, of course, because obviously, you know, when people see see um, you know, the, the system failing so badly um, and failing us as citizens so badly, it you know, it leads to a lack of mm. faith in in that system. But what's worrying is that this this lack of faith is is you know, often manifests itself in 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 a shift to the right and i think you know the the political right um is putting a lot of effort into uh, providing a space for disaffected people people that have completely lost their faith in in, in our governmental leaders um and of course that's really dangerous and i think it's something we perhaps need to be better um at as yeah as environmentalists, but also those who, who are active you know, on, on, politically on, on the political left, is we need to um, provide alternatives. Mm. And as ever, we keep on coming back to you know, the one thing that does provide, you know, seems to be you know, a, a genuine way to get through this issue, and it's participatory democracy, the way mm. to to overcome these failings of, 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 of our governmental systems is to think of new governmental systems and citizens assemblies other forms of parliamentary democracy do really seem to be you know a, a clever and effective way mm. out of, 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 of this mess yeah well so a little while ago I noticed this video with um, Kevin Anderson and a climate scientist uh, called Rockstrom um they were holding conversation here on a thing called climate uncensored johan rockstrom is you know he's known for this work around planetary boundaries and recognizing the limits to the earth systems for where they can be pushed he's one of the um co-directors at the potsdam institute which is a really one of the world's most prestigious institutions very, right very on highly climate regarded, absolutely um and um, they got together earlier this year to talk about um, risks and challenges and delivering Paris. Ha ha. <laughs> um, we're, I think we're likely to breach the, the, the main Paris commitment this year, if not next year. Um, but they have this conversation, which I thought was actually, I mean, if you're a nerd and you like listening to things about this stuff, then, then go and check it out. It was great. But... Um, what I found interesting about it was um, Kevin Anderson's particularly good, isn't he, on bringing in a sense of a, a question of equity, a question of social justice, a question of global justice. What, he, what, are we, what are we doing and how are we doing it? And at one point, um, they dug into a little bit of understanding conservatism in the IPCC process. And to me... That was extremely interesting because in XR, when we launched in 2018, we had um, a, a critique of the IPCC process saying it's, it's been, it's, it's quite slow, it's really big, it's quite cumbersome, the information is coming very fast, so actually working with five years old data might it's not be very helpful. Yeah. And um, that takes an awful long time to put it together and if you look at a spectrum of scientific information and you take the middle part, then you're going to be prone to ignoring the extreme end yeah. of the risk spectrum. Yeah. And so just that, sorry, just to add to that, but um, don't forget with these IPCC reports, there is the full report and there's the summary for policymakers. And mm. whilst the full report is is a purely scientific document, the summary for policymakers is agreed by the member states. So it's agreed by all governments. And of course, it's, it's the policy summary for policymakers that gets all the attention. That's what the press read. That's what gets talked about. But that's not just a strictly scientific document. It's, mm. it's a, a political document. And you know, the thing to bear in mind with that is that everything that's said in the summary for policymakers has been agreed by every single member government. So this is the stuff that everyone agrees on. So, you know, what about, you know, Obviously, when you, when you have to reach full consensus like that, a lot of stuff 
doesn't make it into the summary for policymakers because not everyone should agree on there. Mm. So this is not to say that anything in the summary for policymakers is at all disputable or anything like that, but quite the opposite. Absolutely everyone agrees that this is the case. And therefore it must be, by definition, it must be really conservative. If it, if it was including some of the things that are very likely but not guaranteed or highly possible but not sufficiently well demonstrated yet, none of that stuff goes in. Mm. So of course it is deeply conservative. Yeah. yeah. And well, I just think it's interesting because for me it feels like, you know, we've been, we've been in this business since 2018 of doing the work of building up a social movement, doing an awful lot of action and push and push and push for try and get change to happen. And over that course of time, I've been, you know, myself working at some points with the media team, looking at messaging. I've been sort of trying to work out how to do better communications around a lot of this stuff. And there was, in the early stages of Exile, there was a lot of um, sort of outcry from some people in the what I would call the establishment kind of climate commentary out, the people who've got the big platforms uh, to, to speak about the science and, um, and so on. And what I noticed at the beginning was that actually there were some experts that came to us and said, oh no, you can't say that like that because it's not scientifically credible and it's not accurate and I wouldn't use that word and you can't say that like that and you can't explain that risk like that because it's actually, you know, not recognised by this methodology. And, and, and the problem, I think, uh, that we had at the beginning was partly that people wanted to make what we were saying more conservative, which is not appropriate to conservativize yourself, <laughs> if that's a word. But it's not a good idea to, to censor yourself on the expression of extreme risk when there is a fucking extreme risk in, in, that needs to be communicated to people. But I also think it's really interesting how over the years, some experts have come out to really support us. You know, so there was equal, me not not maybe not equal measures, but there were there were definitely both sides of that. And for example, um, I think it might have been um, Tim Jackson who wrote a piece for us, basically saying, actually, I've done some back of an envelope calculations based on equity and your culpability as a nation state and the history, we actually ran some numbers out and tried to say, is Extinction Rebellion's demand for net zero target of 2025, is that appropriate given the circumstances? And he came back and said, That's, it's exactly what, if you it's took- the only appropriate if, if, if you took into consideration all of the equity and all of the, the sort of justice considerations that are supposed to be the backbone of all of the international negotiations and all of the policy that's supposed to come out of that. It is all supposed to be rested on the fact that if you did nothing to cause this crisis, you don't have to do the big lion's share of the work to try and change everything either. You should have help with technology, you should have help with money, you should have support as a global community to like still raise the living standards of the world's poorest. And you don't and have to move first, yeah. we have to move and first. And we have to go first. Yeah, yeah. And we have to do extraordinary things to go first. So, I don't know, I was really interested to see that, like, you know, somewhat reflected on, you know, within this uh, discussion by these people. And then just to get to a point where they say, you know, actually privileged people in the global north and in Western societies are really setting mitigation agendas. They're really setting political agendas and they're setting conversations in motion that don't have probably enough of a of a of a of, a, of an open world view in the room because they're so limited. And so this is sort of speaks to the the need then for assemblies as models to bring more voices around a table because the more diverse people that you have looking at a problem, the better the chance of a, of a more wise outcome. That's right? really important because we tend to think, oh, it's fair to let people all have a voice. It's not just that it's fair. You get better decisions. Yeah. You get better outcomes because everything's been thought through first rather yeah. than 
rather than afterwards. If you just get elite groups of, of you know, white men from industrial countries make these decisions, and then people afterwards are like, actually, that's really dodgy. No, yeah. deal with these issues before you make the decisions. Yeah, exactly. Well, and it's interesting, I think, that, you know, what came through the IPCC reports and what now is quite high on the conversation agenda between people who are experts in this field, whether it's policy or climate uh, science itself, is this kind of universal, it seems, support for participatory democratic models as a way of, as a way of finding a just outcome, that you can find a way forwards, that you can find social cohesion on the way, and, you know, most importantly, that it's not trying to solve an agenda that's been caused by a sort of monolithic pyramid scheme or so you know it's like a sort of it's trying to it's trying to put the power back in the back in the right place right so that people can do the right thing yeah. um it's important as well to note that you know the top one percent of emitters are producing over a thousand times more CO2 than the bottom 1%. I and mean, we keep having these numbers thrown around, but it's really, um, you know, it's really important, isn't it, to understand this as a as a crisis of inequality. And actually that, that um, Palm Cup paper we were talking about the deaths from emissions before, it makes it really, really clear in, in the abstract. It's really hard hitting. It says, um, you know, if we allow uh, temperatures to, to reach X, I can't remember what the figure they said, um, the world's richest people will have caused approximately one billion deaths. It's two degrees. Of, if we reach two degrees. Two degrees this century. Mainly richer humans will be responsible for killing roughly one billion mainly poorer humans. And they say this is co comparable with involuntary or negligent manslaughter. Just to go back to this question of, of scientific conservatism that, that um, Rockstrom and Anderson were talking about in their video, um, there's a couple of things. I, th I think one thing to bear in mind um, when talking about, you know, whether, whether Extinction Rebellion's narratives have, have, haven't been fully credible according to the science or whatever, well, everything we said has turned out right so far. <laughs> and whatever aspect of the climate system you look at, um, whether it be sea ice melting or coral reefs dying or, or whatever, it's all happening much, much faster than scientific predictions. So, so yeah, there's, there's no end of evidence that the, the predictions generated by these conservative scientific processes are too conservative. And for me, um, yeah, that's really important because when we're talking about something... Um, as massive as climate change, you know, we're talking about the potential this collapse of civilization, potential death of billions of people, potential extinctions of, of millions of non-human species. You know, there's nothing bigger than this. Um, but if we're only using highly conservative data, that means we're always planning everything based on the best case scenarios. We're mm. going along just hoping that that, that things will be better than we thought. Well, given how enormous the risks we're facing are, shouldn't we start to think about not even just the worst case scenarios, but you know, middle of the road scenarios, mm. things that aren't absolutely the best case scenarios. Well, it, feel, I... it feels like we look at the data and we see again and again that an awful lot of things track the worst case scenario all the fucking time and the rhetoric in the sort of particularly in the international kind of conversation about this tends to track often like a, a best case scenario as in you can have an IPCC report that lands that says basically 1.5 is not going to fucking happen guys you may you may you may need to come to terms with that and you may also need to have a fucking word with yourself about the fact that this is happening and it's not and it's not being stopped and then you have a representative who goes on channel f on the Radio 4 Today show to talk about that report, who will say stuff, use language like 1.5 is still technically within reach. And you think, but if it's politically not within reach, then, then it's, it's not, not within, within reach, reach is yeah. it? So shut up. It's like, what? 
And then on top of that, you've also got the sort of aerosol masking, you've got many, many other problems on top of it, but it's like, the, what, the language is just such a big problem, is it not, that people go, well, you know, if we invent loads of stuff that doesn't exist and we build it all really quickly and quicker than you actually physically can, but, you know, if we can get minerals out of the ground quicker than you actually physically can and if we you know quadruple the size of the mining industry in the next two years then maybe maybe we can do something that might be almost enough and but it's not so but, that, and, it's and, just... and it's really crazy because when you have scientists trying to warn about stuff right or people putting out yeah, scary stuff you're not allowed to to say anything that's not absolutely certain. So this is the, the, the scientific conservatism, right? We're not going to say anything unless we're really, really properly fucking sure that this is yeah. correct. Like, you're not allowed to... You, as a scientist, you're allowed to say what you're certain about. You're not allowed to talk about things that might happen. And yet, when we're talking about mitigation scenarios, all of it is completely uncertain. All of it is based on stuff that might happen, yeah. not solid evidence um, so I really think we need to as a scientific community I think I mean we're starting to see the first signs of it and and you know Kevin Anderson is is brilliant and we do have these you know growing uh, movements within academia scientist rebellion and scientists for, for extinction rebellion of academics who are saying no we shouldn't be bound by this conservative that sort of, conservatism anymore if something might happen and is really fucking massive we should say that this might happen even if we're not 100 percent sure that it will happen and i think that's absolutely right so i had this really interesting discussion with a student um, a couple of weeks ago a student who was attending a summer school that i gave a lecture at and in the q a afterwards he said um so I really think it's, it's, there's this really big issue of, of trust and it's fundamentally important that the public can trust the science. So it's really important that, we, that we're absolutely certain about everything we say and that we, 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 we can't say anything unless there's massive certainty behind it. And I, I thought about it for a minute and I think, I think he's hit on something. He's right about the importance of public trust in science. But if there's a breakdown in public trust in science. It's not going to come because scientists said something might happen by 2030 and it didn't actually happen by 20 until 2035. It's going to come for the opposite reason. It's going to come when you know really really awful shit starts happening everywhere. People that didn't like the victims of of misinformation campaigns, the people who don't know that climate change is happening because the media aren't talking about it. That is where the breakdown in trust in science is going mm. to happen. If yeah, I'm, I'm really scared of, I'm not looking forward to the day when yeah, I, I really think people will be angry with the scientific community for not doing more. You guys knew that this would happen. You guys knew that this would come was mm. coming. Why the fuck didn't you do more to warn us? How on earth could you possibly have thought that it was okay to have this knowledge of what's coming yeah. and not speak about it? Just how on earth did you think it was acceptable behaviour to just go back to your office and write another paper when you knew that the governments were ignoring your research, when you knew that the media weren't covering it? And you knew that you, know, you knew all this stuff and nobody else knew it and you didn't tell us. I think that's a massive dereliction of not just our duty as scientists, but our duty as decent human beings if we're aware of a danger. So yesterday when I came down to London, right, um, as happens every time, it always strikes me, there's a message on the tannoy. If you see something, alert the authorities, let us know. You know, see it, say it, source it. If you see something that might be dangerous, it is your duty as a citizen to let other people know about it. Well, as scientists, we're completely failing at that. Mm. We, we know what's coming, and yet we're scared to speak up because our certainty is only fucking 98% on the models and I'm not going to speak up until it's 99%. What the fuck? You know, it, it's, it, it's an emergency. <laughs> We, the, 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 these, these, these social norms, these academic norms that, that, that hold scientists back, I think we, yeah, we need to 
get beyond that. Well, we're not in normal times, are we? Exactly. That's so it. you can't hold all the norms. I mean, this is this is something that I think is quite important. How the which relates between the the disciplines, if you like, in between science and if you look at the sort of the the intellectual and academic work that's gone into thinking about why do civil disobedience, why do why do nonviolent direct action, because when you live in a context where social norms are being trashed and transgressed, i.e. you're part of a society that's going to kill the next generation, then you obviously take, take some stock of the situation and think, you know, some social transgression, i.e. going and sitting somewhere you're not meant to sit or putting some paint on something you're not meant to put paint on is... Is, is then becomes like a then becomes a, obviously a a useful uh, way to to look at the equivalence of the actions. I think maybe that'd be quite a nice conversation to have with the scientific community about the transgression of social norms, the transgression of the boundaries that we should be holding in sort of moral society, if you like. And then it's a and then it's a call to action, isn't it? Well, I look forward to having that discussion with you. Um, in the meantime, I think um, you know your points are very important, um, and you know if if what needs to happen and if what we all know needs to happen isn't happening, then we have responsibility as individuals to to you know pull any levers we can or use whatever power we have as individuals to fight back against that, and mm. and you know. That, that's why we do what we do, isn't it? We, we want to, to protect what we have, to, to, to defend it and, and stop it being lost. Um, and we feel an obligation to, to do something about it, to just not let everything be destroyed and just sit back and let that happen. So, so if, you, you know, if you feel that sense of duty too, then there's lots you can do. Um, and yeah, check out XR and we look forward to seeing you on the streets. Yeah, and as my friend says, they've got more money than us, but we've got more people. So uh, please join us.